Hi everyone, thank you for coming today. I'm going to be your chair. My name is Tariru Nyomudeza. And thank you for all, like, for coming here. It's quite good. And so we're going to have Lloyd first come up and tell us about, um, like, he's going to have, give us the opening words and tell us about the new Sisiba. Yeah, Lloyd. Thanks. All right, welcome everybody to this, our, our second um, Google Letters to see the memorial, memorial Lecture. I just want to take this opportunity to give you a very brief background to why we set up celebrating the sky behind me here on the back. Google Letters to see was an audacious and, and upcoming young Zimbabwean sociologist who died quite unexpectedly in uh, 2017. We're actually not 100% sure, sure, sure why yet, but we're pretty 90% certain it was something with leukemia. Um, Okay, so he studied, lectured, and researched at three universities, University of Zimbabwe, University of Atlantis Rand, and then he did a PhD here at Stellenbosch, um, where he submitted a thesis titled Language and the Politics of Identity in South Africa, uh, the case of a Zimbabwean Shona and Nibeli speaking migrants in Johannesburg. And I think the, the particular thing about Gugu was that he was a prolific interlocutor uh, between the Zimbabwean and the South African places, so focusing particularly on issue, issues of language, race, citizenship, um, and embodied place. He was writing a book towards the end, end, end of his life, uh, focusing particularly on, 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 on the body as a, as, a, as a kind of migrant, in, within the migrant spaces that he was interested in. Um, he was prolific in the sense that in the six years he spent at Stellenbosch, three as a PhD and three as a postdoc, uh, he managed to publish six articles. Right, so that's basically an article a year, including for autumn years of, 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 of the PhD. In this time, he also published numerous creative and satirical works. He was a bit of a poet and a, and a, um, a sat satire writer, including the poem, a quite hard-hitting poem, Ode to the Nameless, which deals with the tragedy of Kukurundi. So with that, you know, I want to actually obviously commemorate Cougar again and just say to Jeremy Jones, it's great to have another great Zimbabwean scholar talking to us, giving us a presentation, and keeping the Zimbabwean space alive in our department. Great. Um, now we're going to have Bernard introduce us to our speaker for today. Okay, so we're delighted to have Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Jones, who's come to us from Holy Cross, um, College of Holy Cross um, in the United States. Jeremy finished a PhD at the University of Chicago, in 2012. Uh, he also has published uh, particularly famously on a, a piece on the Pia Kia, econ the Pia Kia economy, the hustling economy in Zimbabwe uh, in JSS, I think 2010. Um, he's, uh, prior to, to starting his PhD in Chicago in 2002, he spent more than 10 years in, in Zimbabwe working in the NGO sector and, in, and um, He's also done that work in, work in the United States. Um, he, uh, on a personal note, uh, he, he's, he knew Google very well, I think, during, during the 2000s when he, when, he was do, when he was in Zimbabwe. Um, his partner actually had Google in, in her class um, at UZ uh, for a time. And, and so he was very, he was corresponding with me uh, quite a lot around, around the time of Google's passing. Um, and so it's great to be able to bring him here. And what he's agreed to do and, uh, is to really reflect on Google's work intellectually and think about it in relation to some of his own work, but also in relation to um, the significance of Google's work. Uh, and so, and so um, I'm delighted to, to welcome him here, and I hope that we have a great discussion. I should add that uh, Lucky Montana will offer the first comments in response going along with the seminar format that we've tried this quarter, and, uh, and I invite you all to, um, to engage in the talk, and, and I'm sure it will be a very rich discussion. So thank you, Jeremy, again for coming. Uh, thank you, Bernard. I don't know. Everybody call you Bernard here? Okay. Uh, <laughs> All my students uh, insist on calling me uh, insist on calling me professor, even if I uh, tell them that I actually have a name. So I think it's the Catholic thing. Uh, I'm not a Catholic. 
Uh, I just want to start my timer here. So uh, I've asked uh, Lucky to translate for me for a minute. I'm going to start in Shona. Uh, there's actually a reason for this, so uh, uh, I'm not just uh, I'm not just playing around. Uh, so Shona Mnoti Pamsori Kanunchiru a program, I guess, like this. Uh, so in Shona, just like, what can you, or can I just have the floor to speak about this? So I got, Mr. Hill, Bernard, So we say thank you to you, Bernard, and all others for attending. Yeah. So we say, how you doing? How you doing? And all others who came to attend this. Seminar today. Daido Tanga ne Shona. I want to begin by Shona. Wa mwe wanenge wachi vunzu kuti ne magaye. Some they would ask why. Shno batire. Or what does it do? Wa mwe wanenge wachi te ko. Ano we rengere? Jaga nyora na siziba. And some they will be saying that. Is he reading read what was written by Sisiwa? When talking about those people who have been forced or to speak Shona. And some they will be saying that the white man wants to <laughs> Surprises, let's say. Wa Mugabe, waiti kuvundu tavan. Mugabe used to say that you want to to make people feel afraid. Wanu wanu vundu kaka. And people they will be afraid. Mm. And this way it's a We know my politics is shown up with Zimbabwe. I know about the politics. What thing is Zimbabwe? So, who are you? And this is Mushona. And this is Zimbabwe. As you see, I'm not a Shona person. I don't come from Zimbabwe. Daka kure 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 koko ku America. I was born far, far in America. And you know, was there kind of one African, Kusikra and Daine Makori Makumi, Nemajan? And I didn't know anything about Africa until I was five. Fifteen. Fifteen years. Mm. <laughs> I'm sure I've run over a ring in English. <laughs> People's, people count in, in English in Shona. Saga. So I'm speaking Shona today because I was taught Shona. And through or copying others. Imitating, yes. And this could who never and go to our shona. And I'm not lying that and I'm not lying I can't speak Shona. <laughs> I can't. Jimwe jaga kuosha, jino taura newamwe, noto taza kunzuisa. And some of the important things which have been explained by others, I can't even explain that. Lost my head. Jimwe nguwa, mazwe achu ano ramba, jachose kubuda pa mrumu pangu. And sometimes other ways they can't be explained. I can't even explain. So, this was Google's poem. I'll let you read it for a second. When I first saw this poem by uh, Google to a few months ago, it struck me in several ways. Reading such things always puts me in the mind of someone who stumbled onto the scene of a crime, only to realize that he's somehow implicated. I would suggest that any white person who doesn't feel that way in Zimbabwe is living in a very strange bubble. 
It's strange not because it's unusual. People live in bubbles all over the world. It's strange because it takes a real effort to keep it inflated in Zimbabwe. It's not a kind of passive naivete if you don't understand what it means to be white in Zimbabwe. Such reminders being reasonably common in our field, though, I was perhaps more struck by the paradox in the couplet that ends each of the stanzas. My tongue resists the fluency, my mouth resists the mimicry. In fact, to my ear, it repeats a famous paradox, that of self-reference. To say of English, in English, my tongue resists the fluency, is like the Cretan saying all Cretans are liars. Or yet again, it's like me saying in Shona, and Nigonu Taura Shona. I can't speak Shona. By my reading, the disfluency in his poem is more forced than the fluency. Paradoxes have been central to my own work in Zimbabwe. I've tried to grasp things like elopement marriage, which is simultaneously viewed as normal and non-normative. And recently, I've been thinking about paradoxes surrounding beer and cues and currency. The last era of hyperinflation, not this one that's going on right now, uh, the explosion of zeros on the, on the Zim dollar during that period was pitted against the government's assertion that their value was backed by an indigenous reserve that was well nigh priceless. So they were both valueless and infinitely valuable. Likewise, beer is crucial to both social and economic life all over Zimbabwe, and has been that way for generations, yet it remains outside one of the most critical categories of every life, everyday life in the 2000s, namely basic commodities. So it is basic and not basic. And finally, cues have been ubiquitous in Zimbabwe for at least two decades. How is it, though, that such a normative social form as standing in a line can be seen as a representation of crisis, bewilderment, and even discombobulation? I wonder sometimes if, it's my inter if my interest in paradox is just a personal quirk, if it's basic to all social phenomenon, or if life in Zimbabwe is just especially paradoxical. Siziba seems to have thought the latter. In fact, I think his work might be well summarized using his own words as an extended reading on the absurdities assailing Zimbabweans at home and abroad. And I would add that those absurdities extend well into the past. For the neurosis that Sartre spoke of, the nervous condition, as it's often translated in English, is in fact a state of ramifying paradoxes, pitting one value against another and pulling colonial subjects in opposite directions. I confess, though, I'm also partial to the idea that paradox is just basic to social phenomenon, only that it appears with specific content and force in colonial situations. Now, I'm not actually the biggest uh, poetry reader. Uh, however, uh, I've been thumbing through a an edition by W.H. Auden lately, um, mostly because he wrote during, uh, against the context of World War II, uh, a dim horizon which seems <laughs> quite similar to the dim horizon we face now. In one poem, Advent, he writes something reminiscent of Siziba's poem. If the muscle can feel repugnance, he writes, there's still a false move to be made. By repugnance, he doesn't mean disgust, but rather the original sense of that term, i.e. fighting or pushing back. You might even call it contradicting or speaking against. Repugnance then would be the opposite of fluency, a term that he suggests, or which suggests is a state of flow or relaxation. Of course, as everyone knows, fluency doesn't mean the absence of resistance. We all struggle to put things into words. It points rather to the capacity to overcome everyday resistance in a relatively unruffled manner. What I'd like to talk about today, then, is this pairing of fluency and mimicry, one which is deeply and quite literally felt and embodied, and one which is imbued with relations of power. Language, Siziba writes, following Bourdieu, who was himself following Marcel Mauss, is a technique of the body, a mouth, as it were, a tongue, turn of the head, a rise in pitch. He trained his eye specifically on those Zimbabweans, youth, women, ethnic minorities, who were, quote, compelled to perform the voice and body of those oppressing them, or the voice and body of those who posed a threat to them. In keeping with his poem, though, I want to apply some of his insights to English, or rather, to the multivalent Shona term, Churungu. I've left it untranslated in my title, um, but as you might have seen on the poster, in addition to referring to the English language, it can refer to a lot of other things, like white people's ways, for instance, or even modernity. And it's notable and useful, I think, that such matters only really occur on the edges of Siziba's analysis. Sometimes the matters conveyed in Shona, uh, though not in Devele, 
uh, as Churungu, only appear by way of suggestion in his work, as in the locative title for people in Newtown, Johannesburg, is Saladini, where the Salads live. So I will return to the matter of salad uh, as I proceed. Siziba wrote on a variety of topics, sometimes alone, sometimes with Gibson and Lube, sometimes with Lloyd Hill. And his published work is multidisciplinary, covering sociolinguistics, media studies, and literature criticism. We first met each other in the mid-2000s before he came here. We were both participants in a Codestria working group on African youth identity. At the time, he was studying a Zimbabwean music genre called Urban Grooves. Many of his informants for the project were from the same city where I do my research, Chitungwiza, just outside of Harare. Although his work on that subject was only published in the Codestria newsletter, traces of his analysis appear in an article that he wrote on the novel, Harare North, which considers young people caught up in Zimbabwe's gerontocratic and phallocentric order, his terminology. Notwithstanding the scope of his work, in addition to the general interest in Zimbabwean absurdities, there are some clear patterns to be found in his articles. Thematically, many of them concern what we might simply call voice, how it's established, for whom, how it might be displaced, what kind of work it does. His articles also show an extended engagement with the work of Irving Goffman and Pierre Bourdieu. From Goffman, he took both specific concepts, especially from the early work on stigma, as well as a general sense that social life is comprised of performance, enacted in an infinity of minute interactions and marked by prudent banalities. Uh, those phrases come from Bourdieu, who was himself an avid reader of Goffman. Uh, from Bourdieu, Siziba took a whole set of concepts, habitus, field, hexis, doxa, and symbolic domination. And those of you who are familiar with Bourdieu will know that these concepts are intended to form a flexible system that can be used to capture any number of social phenomena. Habitus concerns the relative coincidence of social structure and embodied practice. It's kind of a pre-reflective knowing what to do, generated by repeated encounters with specific fields of power, generative of right action, and regenerative of the very structures that produce it. Hexis is specifically a matter of bodily comportment, how to carry oneself, how to walk, how to sit, how to speak. Fields concern objective relations between positions in a particular arena of life, in fact, Bourdieu says to think in terms of a field is to think relationally. And that means that one's own positions are always and only established vis-a-vis -vis those of others. Doxa concerns common sense, albeit with the twist that Bourdieu considers it to always be the product and expression of power relations. People put up with a great deal, he once told Terry Eagleton. That's what I mean by doxa. Symbolic domination, finally, is the power to impose principles of division, knowledge, and recognition. To control the structure of fields, give shape to doxa, and in that sense, provide a horizon for habitus and hexes. To illustrate, consider his discussion over several articles of Zimbabweans living, quote, out of habitus uh, in Johannesburg. As you will know, a large population of Zimbabweans has migrated to South Africa, especially the northern parts. Hilbro and Yeovil in Johannesburg, in particular, have come to be dominated by Zimbabweans and other foreign migrants. One of Siziba's key targets is the widespread notion that Zimbabwean Debele speakers will be easily absorbed into South African society, whereas Shona speakers will not. This is a widespread notion in Zimbabwe. Standard Shona is unquestionably hegemonic in Zimbabwe. And many speakers of the language have neither the inclination nor the opportunity to learn Debele. Besides simplifying the linguistic landscape of Zimbabwe itself, though, this notion fails to grasp what kind of language competencies are actually involved in fitting in. Zulu and Debele are close enough that those with a strong, without a strong grasp of either will fail to tell the difference. But fluent speakers of either one will tell the difference. Those differences include vocabulary and accent, but the two languages are also linked to what we might call in different indexical orders. Siziba uh, borrows this from Jan Blomart, who took it from Michael Silverstein, who also sort of took it from Goffman. Uh, the larger semiotic surround of language, it includes its relation to other languages, the way that it's spoken, including its connection to a certain hexis, and ideas about typical speakers. In short, the indexical order tells us what differences matter, what constitutes a sign. In spaces dominated by Zimbabweans, Shona use is common, spaces in South Africa. Uh, and a socialect uh, called Isizulu Semaflatini predominates as a common tongue. 
It is in spaces where Zimbabweans are not dominant, however, that major issues arise. There are several ways that they handle such spaces, Suziba explains. Key amongst them are efforts to simply remain quiet and not stick out. This is especially true of township spaces like Dipslut. I think I'm saying that right. My, my Shona is better than my Afrikaans. So. Uh, much better. Uh, but it holds in other areas of what he calls, following Goffman, the interaction order. This would be places like combis or grocery stores or things like that. In part, the act requires a silencing of voice, especially voice in Shona. Uh, it's not really a speaking part to maintain Goffman's theatrical metaphor. But it also demands certain shifts in hexes and associ <coughs> associated matters of dressing. One has to look the part, as it were, so that one's presence is not notable. Another option for those with greater command over the linguistic code is to try and inhabit the larger habitus of South African life, including such matters, or matters as prosody and intonation, a full repertoire of passing. And certainly in my time in South Africa, I've met Zimbabweans who have managed to do this. Um, one of the most interesting interventions he makes, Siziba that is, is the notion of cross-identification. The point here, I think, is for Zimbabweans to try and fit into local categories of otherness rather than foreign ones. So acting the part of a Zulu when no Zulus are around, or the part of other recognizable South African identities when, the com when in the company of Zulu speakers. This distinction strikes me as critical insofar as it demonstrates both the multiplicity of otherness and people's capacity acquired by habitus or express efforts at mimicry, in the case of Zimbabweans, to absorb a polyphony of other voices. The other, we might say, is not one. There are many others. Now, cross-identification is also a term used by Judith Butler, though it doesn't appear that Siziba took it from her or even used it in her sense. Uh, but there is a productive crossover. She re uses it to refer to the destabilizing effects of drag, cross-dressing, which suggests that a real femininity and real masculinity are themselves performances. And I think much the same could be said here. Authentic South Africanness is also a performance, albeit that one that is more effective than most Zimbabweans can muster, emerging from so deep within one's habitus that it is misrecognized, as Borgio would say, as natural. Such performances feel natural because they come to us naturally. In Borgio's sense, we are systematically deceived by our own habitus. Authentic South Africanness is clearly a gendered performance, too. And we see this in Siziba's discussion, even though he doesn't dwell on it much. In reconstituting their bodies, as he says, for their interlocutors, Zimbabweans are inhabiting highly gendered forms, not just ethnic or linguistic ones. Indeed, having to reconstitute one's body for an interlocutor is a fact of life for women all over the world. There's clearly a performative aspect to masculinity as well especially the assertive variety associated with most of the spaces Siziba describes, and the assertive variety that many uh, Zimbabweans particularly associate with Zulus. Presumably then, a lot of South Africans, men and women, will go to great and similar lengths not to stick out. Sasha Newell, in his description of, description of bluffers in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, people who bluff the true self by engaging in competitive displays of fake European and American labels, uh, argues that Butler's analysis tends to overestimate the subversive quality of such performances. The same can't be said of Siziba. His use of cross-identification is not so much about subversion. For him, it's not a matter of player parody. The stakes are all too real, even if, and if the imitation is successful, it rather reconstitutes the gendered and ethnic status quo than challenging it. The Zimbabweans, he describes, live in constant fear of being found out. As he says, quoting Goffman, they are discreditable uh, and go to great lengths to avoid being marked, makiswa in Shona, uh, a term that accords well with Goffman's argument, uh, but rather comes from the terminology of football, uh, i.e. being marked by your opponent uh, as opposed to playing zone defense. Uh, Zimbabweans seem keen to keep South Africans focused on the zone rather than themselves as individuals. As an example, I want you to consider this short video, which is an actual parody of this logic. Uh, it is the product of the blooming world of Zimbabwean social media humor. It came out a few months ago. Uh, I hope the volume on this is okay.
well in line with what Wendy Willems identifies as the Zimbabwean predilection for self-deprecatory humor, in which they make fun of their own suffering. The problem faced by this young man, as a figure, mind you, not a real person, is his inability to imitate convincingly. He knows that passing requires a certain hexes, hence the shift from a gait and dressing that one could see in any Zimbabwean location to one humorously marked by the early 2000s Kwaito style and beat. The hope is that this hexis will be prophylactic enough to literally let him pass. He's even acquired the linguistic ability to hear and respond to basic questions in Zulu. No one told him authenticity required the ability to dance guara guara, though. This is an interesting interpolation of an old racist canard about Africans' talent for dancing. dancing rather. His inability suggests both the uncoolness of Zimbabweans vis-a-vis -vis their South African counterparts, they're kind of like country bumpkins, and their figurative coding with whites, who also can't dance, including me. This latter possibility, it seems, is further suggested by the shift from Trumpies to The Lion Sleeps Tonight, which I can assure you is exactly the song that most white Americans think of when they think of Africa. Before I proceed, it's worth pausing to consider the import of this analysis from Siziba. He provides an extended account of the dynamics of black Africans trying to imitate other black Africans where both parties read each other as other. The far more remarked dynamic in the literature of Africans imitating whites, which more in a moment, is absent. Or rather, it's kind of an absent presence because the going idea among a certain category of South Africans, he suggests, is that Zimbabweans, through their better command of English and their deferential hexes, are closer to whites. Uh, so that connotation is one of servility. There's also a matter of sort of semiotic deduction, not really fact. The South African-based Zimbabweans I know view whites in almost purely market terms. They would certainly balk at any claim that they wanted to be like them. It bears noting, too, that a very similar association exists in Zimbabwe, only there it marks people of Malawian ancestry instead of uh, Shonor and Debele ancestry. Throughout the 20th century, many domestic workers for whites were Malawian, and Malawians and Mozambicans were long overrepresented among commercial farm laborers for white farms. So, Chirung. I think Saziba's emphasis on the multiplicity of otherness sheds important light on that subject, though he didn't focus on it himself. In fact, the underlying gist of his analysis stands in stark contrast to a certain social orthodoxy in Zimbabwe, in which all kinds of alterity or difference are reduced to a single chain of binary oppositions with Chirungu right at the center of them. Such oppositions aren't natural. They are rather made natural. Well, as you'll know, race has been at the center of events in Zimbabwe over the past two decades. White people and the institutionalization of the English language were always critical to the objective structure of the economy, as Bourdieu would put it. It was a landscape created by white British imperialism and solidified by very explicit structural racism. White supremacy, therefore, could be said to be the frame for even the smallest matters in Zimbabwe, such as Siziba's English lesson, even in the absence of actual white people, whom relatively few Zimbabweans regularly engage with. Where Joe writes that when black and white people talk, the whole history of their languages talks through them. Chirungu might be best grasped as a particular and particularly decisive cluster of habitus, doxa, and fields, built up around this objective structure of white supremacy. As I noted at the start, it has multiple valences and consequently links several indes indexical orders having to do with language use, conception practice, practices, mannerisms, and social location. In addition to referring directly to the English language, it can be used to refer to the ways of white people, to speak more generally of westernness, and provocatively, to be westernized is to be possessed by churungu, pingo ne churungu, uh, an act that is grammatically marked as feminizing, moreover. And finally, it can be used to speak of modern times, as in the common phrase, chave churungu, uh, which means uh, we're doing it the white people's way, uh, you might say. Uh, literally. 
With the partial exception of Engl English language, none of this is seen as good. Or rather, in asserting positive things about contemporary life or Western ways, no one would invoke Chirungu. They would stick to the bare linguistic meaning of the term. In fact, Chirungu in all the other guises is almost always evoked as a sign of crisis and loss. History is the sorcery of the other, as the Shilambimbe once called it. The key effect, again, is to reduce multiple orders of complex and gradiated difference to the same basic social polar opposition. Two linguistic anthropologists, Sue Gall and Jer Judith Irvine, <coughs> have found this process to be quite common in indexical orders and linguistic ideology more broadly. And they call it fractal uh, recursivity, drawing on the reiterative logic of fractals, which have the same logic uh, sort of repeated over and over. Take an old book from 1979, it's called Pasichgare. Pasichgare. It's the sort of book that a student in an upper level Shona course might inspect. The title itself is one of the multiplex signs that revolve around Chirungu, as its very utterance suggests an eclipsed and presumably racially authentic form of living. Shona Vernacular Dictionary defines Pasichgare as the <coughs> time of old ways and customs, Tsika Nemagariru. Uh, practice before whites conquered the country. The book opens with a chapter on the coming of whites, Varungu, after showing how whites brought with them completely different ways of living, which they took to be better, the writer goes on to explain how they made people throw away or forsake their own ways. And I'm going to translate this. In order to be taken as a real human, a person had to act like a white person, think like a white person, speak English like a white person, wear white people's clothes, and walk like a white person. Everything had to be done the white way, je churungu. Even today, you hear people say, so-and-so is white, murungu, meaning he or she has succeeded in life and should be revered or respected. The majority of people gave up their local traditional black names, mazita echiwan, in order to take white ones, echirungu, in order to show that they were modern. Others tried to change their skin color with beauty cream so that people would think they were mis mixed race and had white blood in their veins. Now, white here is more or less continuous with Western, uh, as well as with modern or contemporary. The passage also broaches what might be taken as the main antonym of Chirungu, which is not Chishona in the first instance, but rather Chivanu, as in Mazite Chivanu. Chivanu means the ways of black African people, uh, here located historically before the coming of whites. Chishona might be best understood as one mode of Chivanu, uh, which can also be ascribed by analogy to other ethnicities, such as Ndebele, uh, other non-white races, uh, or broken down further in, into regional or even kinship-based practices. At least in this telling, it is also the opposite of mission Christianity. So witchcraft, for instance, would be filed in the category of Chivanu. And if somebody uses Chivanu on you, you better watch out. Okay? So... We have a certain set of oppositions here. Black, white, vernacular, English, past, present, ancestors, Christianity. Take another instance, though, a reading from a comprehension exercise in a Form 2 Shona textbook. It was first published in 1985, but it's still in use in the early 2000s when I acquired it. It tells a story. It takes place on a Saturday afternoon in a rural area of Zimbabwe when a character called Zex, uh, Z-E-X, uh, visits his grandfather from his home in the capital Harare. The conversation starts badly when the former greets the latter while standing up with his hands in his pockets. The correct greeting would have entailed his squatting and clapping <coughs> before even uttering a word. And after being reprimanded for disrespecting an elder, Nkuru, Zex apologizes, explaining that the fashionable shorts he's wearing are too tight for him to kneel or squat. <laughs> Children these days, his grandfather complains, you've completely lost the traditions of the people. Tsika, say Chuan. You boys don't know how to dress. You cook your hair until it's straight as a mule's. This is an old, uh, uh, an old story. Uh, grandson, don't rely on the ways of white people, Chirungu. They came with indigestion, Chirungu River. Uh, this is just poetic license. I don't think those two words are related. Instead of quietly accepting this critique, as a well-mannered youth should, Zex quotes a common proverb claiming that time changes everything. Kare, agare, kare. 
The past doesn't remain the past. This makes his grandfather so angry that he invokes his ancestors, then launches into what would seem to be a very incongruous critique of women's makeup. The things girls smearing on themselves these days ruin their appearance, he says. I saw one and felt sorry for her because I thought she had been beaten up, but it was just red lipstick. Undeterred, Zex expands his argument, saying that life is better these days because people eat better, dress better, travel more easily, and live more hygienic lives. At this, his grandfather explodes. All of the troubles we have now are caused by young people, he says. In our past, we had never heard of somebody abandoning a baby. Most young people are addled by beer and marijuana. Keep in mind that none of this had come up in the actual story. He's just free-forming. Life is no longer sacred to you. Penu, wemunu, kwamuri, aunaud, auchaera, sorry. A person can get killed just like that. You can, you can find in-laws dancing the robot and the bump jive together. And that's what you call the ways of chirungu, white people. The grandfather storms off, and hours later, Zex realizes that he's been abandoned. He starts walking back to Harare, the place, the passage concludes, where his chivanu had been eaten up. The chain of associated oppositions grows then. In addition to black, white, vernacular English, ancestors, Christianity, and past, present, we now have, at the very least, elder youth, the former being the past and the present, rural urban, gender propriety versus gender impropriety, uh, manners, rudeness, proper speech versus improper speech, sacred taboo, and even soberness and drunkenness. The passage also provides an instance of a second pattern highlighted by Irvin and Gall, that is icon iconization, the way a particular attribute of language or sign use comes to stand in for the character of the speakers or users. It is offered as an example of a ronde zero, a narrative description. This is one of the key sections of O-level exams in Shona. In previous pages, after laying out the characteristics of this uh, kind of account, the authors of the book repeatedly direct students to use language that is appropriate for the characters they describe. If it's a grandmother talking to a grandchild, the difference in generation should come out clearly in the speech. The grandmother's speech should be full of proverbs, idioms, and onomatopoeia. Uh, but this does not, however, give students license to include English or town slang in the speech of youth. That, they said, should be totally excluded. Now, John and Jean Komarov famously write of a similar phenomenon amongst Tswana speakers here in South Africa and on the border with Botswana. There, they say, a poetics of contrast and symbolics of dualism and difference oppose Setswana, the ways and language of Tswana, to Sekhoa, the ways and language of whites. They use one term, the use of one term always called forth the shadow of the other. They are each other's obverse rather than their opposite. For whites, they write, the division between the two had a cultural archaeology in post-Enlightenment European stereotypes of African otherness. In brief, a European ideology of alterity. For the Tswana, on the other hand, the very ability to feel and recognize oneself as a native, they say, depended on the presence of a racialized other, whites. That doesn't mean that the racialization of self-recognition in that case was purely derivative, in response to uninvited attempts to civilize them, Tswana speakers erected their own tropes of otherness. They did so with the hope of asserting some control, the Komarov say, imaginative as well as material, over a world increasingly outside that control. Still, it goes without saying that the new Tswana self-understanding was thoroughly wrapped up in the categories of the colonial field, in Bourdieu's sense. This is the very definition, in fact, of symbolic definition of domination when the understanding of a situation and a set of relations depends on instruments and knowledge shared with the dominator, and when schemes people use to perceive and evaluate themselves or their dominators are the product of naturalized classifications of which they themselves are the product. That's a quote from Bourdieu. It's perhaps clear then why the contestation of symbolic order of Chirungu has been so central to anti-colonial thought in Zimbabwe. Indeed, both of the texts cited here are part of a project of symbolic rehabilitation. Such texts echo, or more, more or less explicitly, I think, uh, Fanonian claims that to speak a language is to absorb a culture, and that every dialect is a way of thinking. As the Komarovs note, though, one of the most striking facts about these stark imaginative dualisms is that they veiled the reality of increasing interconnection, even if it was starkly unequal interconnection. 
The symbolic politics of dualism and difference, they write, refracted a general tendency of colonial encounters to force ever deeper conceptual wedges into ever more articulated and indivisible orders of relations. And this actually represents a third pattern highlighted by Irvin and Gall, which they call erasure. In the case of Chirungu, it is not just material interconnection that is veiled, but at a semiotic level, the fact that code shifting and multilingualism, including degrees of command over English grammar and vocabulary, multiple dialects and registers of speech in Shona, uh, the fraught standardization of that language, which is still fraught, uh, the creative possibilities of voicing, using words and signs without claiming them to be one's own. All of this is lost uh, when we reduce things to these binaries. Also erased is the possibility that westernness does not equal whiteness. This despite the fact that from very early on, the Chirungu that a lot of Zimbabweans were supposedly imitating was a product not of white people or from Britain, but rather what we might call a product of the Black Atlantic. That is, uh, hence the reference to things like the bump jive. Uh, now, a quick examination of ZANU-PF political discourse over the past two decades would show a near continuous instrumentalization of this discursive system. The much discussed figure of the sellout, for instance, is entirely wedded to and expressive of, expressive of notions of Chirungu. And it's no coincidence that the usual suspects for selling out are those associated with terms on the right side of each of these divisions. Disrespectful, westernized, English-speaking urbanites. One exception would be the ancestor-Christian divide, uh, since the two have largely been resolved into versions of one another. Uh, so for instance, take these uh, advertisements from the 2002 presidential election. Uh, the one on the right here, uh, you see Morgan Shangirai, the uh, opposition leader, uh, and the text says Shangisan, which is a derogatory uh, use of his name, uh, thinks that Zimbabwe is tea, which he is serving to the white man. Uh, don't let him sell out your birthright, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, on the other side, it's hard to see the picture, actually. Uh, Morgan Changirai is in the corner up there uh, in blown up form, accepting money and accolades from whites who are quite literally behind him. Text suggests that like Judas, he would sell out his country, or perhaps Robert Mugabe, uh, or perhaps Jesus, uh, for 30 pieces of silver. And it exhorts voters to return not to ZANU-PF per se, but to the people. People echoed a larger slogan of that era, which was people first. Uh, but it also echoes Chiwanu. And this connection was much clearer in the Shona version of the ad, uh, which also called Judas the ancestor of all sellouts, uh, as opposed to the traitor of traitors. That such rhetoric erased a good deal is obvious, I think, and many scholars have said as much, including Siziva and Lube in their analysis of Mugabe memes. I want to finish, though, by focusing specifically on the generational divide in youth. Youth are, in a sense, iconic of Chirungu, and urban ones in particular are often associated with every term on the right side of this equation. Uh, any association with such matters rudeness, uh, improper speech, uh, certain kinds of drunkenness, uh, the use of English, uh, gender impropriety, that is not inhabiting proper gender categories. Uh, all of this is taken up uh, as evidence that they are mimicking whites. And again, it's not at all surprising that youth have been a key target of ZANU-PF politicking, which has been explicitly aimed at reforming them. And I use the term reform advisedly. President Mugabe once referred to the MDC as mentally deficient children. And he often paired discussion of youth with fulminations about whites and Western imperialism. Speaking at a state funeral in the early 2000s, he noted that the murder of the deceased, Kane Mkala, which was pinned on the opposition, uh, rather dubiously, uh, was the bloody outcome, these are his words, of an orchestrated, much wider, and carefully planned terrorist plot by internal and external enemy forces headed by Britain which, he said, is corrupting our youth, showering them with trinkets, drugs, and drinks to get them ready for terrorism. Commentary surrounding the formation of the infamous National Youth Training Program, which started around the same time, and which Siziba discusses in his article on Harare North, took a similar tack. 
The white man, through his propaganda, has managed to separate the black youth's body from his mind, one ZANU-PF official said. A columnist for the state-run Herald claimed that the training would prevent youth from becoming certified slaves of Western neocolonialism. It will address the effects of the cultural nuclear bomb of imperialism that has diluted our youth of directions. And then perhaps most prominently, one of the main soundtracks of the land seizures, Comrade Chink's Hunda Yeminda, includes this interlude, which I've translated. Uh, the bold uh, is English in the original. Yeah, let me tell you guys, you don't know anything. Let me tell the little boys here in Zimbabwe. Of course, you're born free. But when you say you're born free, what do you think that makes us? What were we born? These boys and girls of the Nose Brigade. You're playing with fire with white people. What do you think you'll get from them? Most of the time, they're devils, Satans, like you hear about in the Catholic Church. It's funny if you listen to it. Uh, they have barbed wire tails. Watch out, they'll spread blood. They don't love you. They'll trick you into selling out our country. They played this about every 15 minutes uh, on TV when it first came out. As here in South Africa, born free refers to those born out after the country attained majority rule. The Nose Brigade was a name for a paradigmatic, racially alienated black urban youth, the equivalent of what you might call a coconut here in South Africa. The term was first popularized in the 90s and was yet another instance of iconization. Members of this group were perceived to be speaking English, or even worse, Shona, in a nasal fashion, and in doing so, aping the nasal speech of British and Americans. One could scarcely come up with a more telling icon, in fact. Such youth were speaking both in a foreign language and in a foreign voice, channeling whites, as it were. Not coincidentally, they are said to have acquired this habit from foreign media and from their education at former Group A whites-only schools. Because many of those schools were structured around the Oxford examination system, that is the British national curriculum, students wouldn't be taught local history, culture, or language. Indeed, in many cases, use of the vernacular was banned entirely. A more recent term for this group, and I told you I'd come back to this, was masalala, salads. Salad was an icon of a white diet and something that a lot of people consider both tasteless and unsatisfying, something that's on the side of the meal, not the real thing. It's worth noting that both categories, nose brigade and salad, had connotations of compromised gender. Salad was considered by many men to be a female food, uh, as opposed to meat, uh, while female nagging and gossip are often imitated in nasal ways. Comrade Chinks thus took it as his prerogative as elder, uh, both in the sense of age and with reference to his experience in the liberation struggle, to sit youth down and lecture them on the air of their ways. Now again, salad involves a series of erasures. Few people would claim, in fact, to be a munoz or a musalala. It's a category of negative ascription. The idea that such people are not fluent in vernacular is regularly disproved as well. It's quite possible to be perfectly fluent in more than one language, uh, proved by none other than Robert Mugabe who is very uh, accomplished in both languages, I think. At the same time this rhetoric was being deployed, the government instituted a policy of 75% local content, meaning 75% of the things that you heard on radio and TV had to be locally produced. Now, lots of people have written about this, uh, and it was at the heart of Ziziba's exploration of urban grooves, a genre that really exploded to life because of this policy. And there are other uh, accounts, uh, quite interesting ones if you're interested, uh, that come to us from Recopanswe Mate, Tendai Chari, Irikidzai Manase. A lot of these guys are here in South Africa. Uh, but I want to play you a song from the early years of the policy which will illustrate some final points. Uh, uh, this is a translation of this. Uh, now keep in mind uh, that this is the early 2000s. So I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to uh, claim that this is a great song, but it was a very popular one. I can get it to start. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, 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 u
going on in this song. On one hand, you have the reiteration of key aspects of the discourse on Chirumu. In fact, it basically repeats the tropes of Zek's trip to the rural areas. And part of the joke is the pairing of rap-based claims to authenticity and masculinity, think Tupac, with signs of uh, the character in the songs, uh, the sign that his black masculinity is in fact deeply compromised. Uh, he won't do uh, masculine work like uh, chopping wood, uh, herding cows, etc. He is, to invoke another term of semiotic iconization, soft, uh, a characteristic that is also associated with Churungu. On the other hand, though, it is also clear that the voice being imitated, while Western, is in no way white. It is the affected voice of the black American ghetto. It is also obvious that the singer, XQ, is not voicing himself but rather a figure of cultural, and given the access to pizzas, CDs, and doctors, economic elite. This is what Goffman would call a say for or mockery. And I think it brings us full circle to the question of fluency, voice, and imitation. Language use, properly understood, is always irreducible to a single voice. We are always expressing other people's voices, and those others cannot be reduced to binary oppositions. Some voices, including our own, we take to be natural. Our own voice, let's say. But if we take Bourdieu's arguments seriously, they too are products of imitation, naturalization, and performance. Indeed, Bourdieu, and Ziziba as well, would argue that there's really no habitus or language acquisition that does not depend on mimicry or mimesis, uh, as Bourdieu writes, and no speaking that does not hinge on categories of alterity, a world of exemplary others that we can use to convey meaning. We constantly voice those others, through mockeries like this one, but also through stagings, through media, and through the vast world of indirect discourse on all uh, and kinds of citation uh, that, as Goffman called it, heteroglossia in Bakhtin's terms. I've lost my last page. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know where it went. Uh, so, uh, I think it returns us uh, to conclude to this notion that we get from Ziziba. Uh, of the multiplicity of otherness, 
And then you're constantly trying to imitate people uh, who can be all kinds of categories, uh, but those categories tend to be reduced in particular ways using linguistic ideologies and particular kinds of symbolic, symbolic domination. And Chirungu is really at the heart of that in the Zimbabwean case. Uh, I would not venture uh, whether it's true in the case of South Africa, um, but I would guess that it is, uh, that the ability to speak English and Afrikaans goes along with all kinds of uh, other forms of uh, signifying behavior. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. I'm sorry I, I lost the last page. <laughs> 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 She's going to open up um, with some questions and comments, then everyone can just lift up their hands and I'll just point to you guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think I really like the piece, like, where you really managed maybe to, get, to, or to capture maybe the meaning of the word children, being a white person or maybe the white culture and stuff. And what I really like is you also managed maybe to, to figure out or maybe to expose the social construction of the word. It doesn't only mean that it's the English language, you know, but it stresses on how the people, you know, or how the dress, the culture, they are adopting the whiteness culture. Whereby they are using, they are, they are now living their own cultures and they are adopting the white culture. And I think it also relates maybe, or maybe it comes back maybe to, or to, or to the impacts of globalization. How are these African cultures, or maybe the Shona Pese, or maybe the people from Zimbabwe, are bearing down their own cultures, maybe, maybe trying maybe to improve their own lives with ad adoption of the whiteness and stuff. So, but what I really think is also maybe important, maybe, is to, to trace or maybe to try and find out how did this term come into being, or, how, or where does it come from? Like, in my own language, Chirungu English came with, with bonds, or maybe with the same, with, with the sheep, the same. So, or what does it mean, how does it come, come into being, you know, how did it develop, and why does those people maybe try maybe to adopt the wildness culture and stuff, so that the, in one, another thing, <laughs> it was just like a job, you know. When we saw the lyrics of that song, Bonde mm Nina, -hmm. yeah. how do you feel as a white person was studying those people who used to, to say, these white people, they don't love you, they have a steel or a big barbed wire tail, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't see any, you know, like, how do you feel as a, a social anthropologist yeah. or maybe, how mm -hmm. does it, what does it mean maybe in an anthropologist? Yeah, thanks, sorry I seem to have forgot two things. Yeah, yeah. another very, very important thing is, but did you manage maybe to think around the world Hirung or being Murung, a white person, were, were related to Mabung. You know, in our in our own culture, you know, Murung, Mubung, Dung is a white person. But when we say Hirung now, we are saying this classic, this modernity. You know. Can you please maybe try maybe to express something there? Like, yeah. How do you think about those about those words? Mabuni, yeah. the white people, Chirungu. Mm -hmm. But to me, or to us, it's one of the Chirungu means modernity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, where the word comes from, um, I don't actually know. Uh, certainly, this is a a word that has variants all over the region. Uh, and I think you could trace the use of Mzungu uh, 
up through East Africa, and it, I think it has some relation uh, in what is now Zimbabwe to the presence of, uh, of Portuguese or Muslim traders going a long way back. Uh, however, at a certain point, uh, the incorporation of, of white people into sort of local discourse, I think, changes, and that's really the, the moment of, of colonial domination. Up to a certain point, and you see this in like uh, 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 the, the structure of, of clans and totems in Zimbabwe, you find people even using like uh, Portuguese words as their, as their totem, as their name, senor, senoro. Um, and it seems that a lot of uh, terminology from Portuguese and from, uh, as well as Afrikaans, also makes its way into Zimbabwe probably before, uh, before the pioneer column, uh, certainly Portuguese. Um, so where exactly it comes from, uh, I don't know. It would be interesting to think about uh, how it's a, also a product of a certain history of missionization um, and the various missionizations, which goes along with the linguistic history of, of Shono itself. Uh, because different, uh, different churches basically recorded Shona in different ways, and it's way where we get up till now these sort of divisions of dialects in Shona, like Kore Kore or uh, Karanga uh, or Ndao or uh, uh, even so far as uh, the other side in Mate Beleland with, with Kalanga. Uh, so a lot of that has to do with missionization, and it's my guess uh, that you would find a history of this term being used uh, uh, in that uh, venue. But I don't actually know. Uh, maybe here somebody else knows. Um, how do I feel about uh, Comrade Jinx? Uh, I'm more worried about his name, to be honest, than I am uh, uh, about what he says. Um, uh, ironically, uh, Comrade Jinx is... Uh, lived in the neighborhood where I did my research. Uh, I don't think I ever ran into him, but uh, uh, I don't think that, uh, it's kind of a performance in a, in a strict sense. It's like, I don't, I don't know that he actually means that all white people are, are devils. Um, uh, although, uh, you who are from South Africa will know that there's a certain politics to talking about uh, white people in those terms. Uh, going back here uh, uh, with, with several people getting in trouble for, for saying exactly those things, like, uh, how does the song go? Bulala is, how's it go? Bulala is Bunu, something like that. Yeah. Is that how it goes? Yeah, yeah kill the boar. Uh, sorry. I, yeah. Uh, it's a very similar song. I think it has a very similar effect, to be honest, which is that it's not really addressed to uh, killing white people. Uh, and if you look at the logic of, of Chirungu in Zimbabwe, I would say that a lot more people associated with white people uh, were, uh, were victimized uh, during this period than actual white people. Um, violently victimized, that is. Uh, leaving aside the, the land seizures. Um, as for the various terms, um, it's interesting because Chirungu almost always refers to English, the English language, when people use it. And when they want to speak of Afrikaans, they use Chibun. Uh, is that not so? Yeah, but from the context, being a Shona people, Chirungu is that Chawa Chirungu. Chala Chirungu, it's modernity. Yeah. Modernity, like it's classic. Yeah. Or someone who is staying in Ebenhead. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. He went to stay in Ebenhead. Yeah. Yeah, which is. Something related to. Yeah, which is exactly this, these sorts of, of divides uh, that I was talking about. The, the, the association of urban areas with Chirungu, despite the fact that most people there are not Warungu. Uh, is is very pronounced. Uh, there are other words out there used 
uh, explicitly to name white people like Mvet, which I think comes from Afrikaans as well, uh, Vit, uh, and then Muchena, which literally means white. Mabunu. Uh, Mabunu. Um, uh, I get the sense that the, that the people often refer to Mabunu when they're talking about white Zimbabweans, uh, as opposed to foreign white people like me. Uh, uh, I think people can notice the subtle differences between, uh, between those categories of people. Um, so uh, there's, there's a range of, of terminology, I guess, that's, that's used here, but I, I think the, the general notion of, of binary opposition informs basically all of it. Have I answered your question? Yeah. Any more questions or comments? No. Jeremy, thank you. That was very really interesting. I mean, um, yeah, if someone not speaking Shona at all, you know, but working with Google, you know, this is fascinating. Um, when you, when you're to, I'm trying to get your, get your words correctly as I kind of jot them down. And you talk about Chilungu as kind of having two stops uh, and they will roll into one, and then you make your quote your, your, your words, uh, you know, specifically the structure of white supremacy. I mean, obvious great question that, that, that pops into my mind now through my interactions with, with, with Google is how does this extend into Matabele land, and, and, and how does this work as? as I, could, I, I mean, the obvious question I thought to ask you is whether, whether you spoke about this, what, 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 because I never had a conversation about you with, with, with Google, or maybe you did. But the more general question is, how does this work with the second language, you know, given, given what I picked up through Google was this, obviously, this, this tense, particular positionality within, within his and, relationship to Shona. As, 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 as a bilingual speaker, not just a bilingual in the daily, in the, in the, in the daily um, Shona speaker, but in the daily English speaker. How, how does it work? Yeah. I, I know it's pretty outside your room, but you know it. It was, a, it was interesting, actually, when I first read the, the poem, uh, uh, I started to wonder if he was talking about Shona, actually, uh, because, of the, because of the use of R's and L's uh, in Shona and Devele, which is kind of a, a marked difference between the two uh, languages. Uh, Google spoke Shona perfectly better than me, um, certainly, uh, and did a lot of his research in Shona. So uh, <clears throat> I would say that there are ways that that difference can be added on, and certainly has been added on, to this set of uh, relations. I spoke of it briefly with respect to Malawians. Uh, that the way that Malawians often get coded together with, with white people in certain ways, uh, and also feminized uh, in certain ways. Uh, uh, now, that's not always true, uh, but you saw it, for instance, in Mugabe's famous uh, rant about totemless aliens uh, in Mbari, which is the, the oldest uh, black suburb of Harare. Uh, totemless aliens was really a a very uh, explicit way of referencing Malawians and Mozambicans, uh, people who come from elsewhere. And so therefore are likely to be sellouts uh, simply because of that. As for uh, Debele, uh, I think uh, that also appears in this way, uh, not always, uh, but often. Uh, I could give you an example uh, very early in the Honda Yaminda, the land seizures, um, Mugabe uh, said that uh, something to the effect that uh, that Tsangirai had tasted the white man's sugar um, and uh, liked it. Rananjiswa uh, Tsugiri Mewarungu. Uh, Tsugiri is is an old-fashioned word, but it, it comes from Afrikaans as well. Um, most people would use the word sugar. Um, so I remember him saying it, actually, uh, in 2000. And the thing is, is that 
this is kind of coded because uh, lots of people in, uh, lots of Shona people, let's say, uh, associate Lobengula, okay, the king of Debele, uh, with selling out the country for sugar. Um, uh, it's, 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 almost a, it's almost a cliche, uh, actually, that uh, Lobengula sold out the country for, uh, for sugar, and that's why we're in the state that we are. So th that, ethnic, uh, that ethnic divide can appear in that way as well. However, uh, uh, I think th these divides can be sort of flipped around, because at the same time that people think that, we saw, for instance, at the, during the same period uh, that uh, Mugabe put together what he called the cabinet of Amadora Sibin, real men, um, and he explicitly used the, the Debele word for it, uh, because of associations of sort of uh, that people have with Debele speakers as being particularly masculine, um, uh, or standing for a certain kind of assertive masculinity. And that's a very old idea, I think. It goes back before the, uh, before the pioneer column. Uh, so uh, the short answer is yes, they can be sort of added to this logic, but in ways that are a little bit flexible. Uh, does that it? Come to the question. Do, do they use the term? Is it, uh, is it used as much as it incorporated as a loan word? Uh, Chishona. Chirungu. Yeah. I don't think so. No. Oh. Yeah. No. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and I, I don't think, uh, I don't think the, uh, when they say English, they just say Sindhis. How do you say it in Debele? I don't know. Islungu. Yeah. It's hard to say. Uh, keeping in mind, uh, as, as Gugu was, uh, uh, wants to point out uh, that Debele is a political, was originally a, a political entity, uh, not a ethnic one. Uh, that is, it absorbed a variety of ethnicities into a sort of political entity uh, that it uh, covered the areas now in Matibele land. So you had uh, the Debele included people who are Kalanga, which is uh, remarkably like standard Shona. I mean, you could you could learn it that way. Uh, uh, Nambia, uh, which is also like Kalanga, Sutu, Koza, uh, etc. All these people were part of uh, Mate Belvendra in the Kingdom. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I interrupted the chair. I'm sorry. My apologies, chair. <laughs> You might know more about this. Yeah, I, I don't know. No, probably not. So it's maybe decades ago that we talked to Zimbabwe, but we do have on this campus a place called Skiat, which is the Southern Watch Institute for Advanced Studies, which is sometimes referred to as the Southern Watch Institute for Advanced Studies. Advanced what? Advanced Studies. Advanced Studies. No, no. But my real question is um, the term is into Amatiwa, which mm -hmm. one encounters in Mata Bearland a lot, which has a very positive yeah. It's a nice thing. The things of white people, yeah. Yeah, so the things of the whites. So, and it's generational. I don't know that it's generational. I think that I'd be interested to know, you know, we say to young people who are subverting the logics of the vernacular logics, what is it? Saving up the binary. Um, but this must be going back to the early 20th century already when young men, particularly from Mata Verde, went to Johannesburg to work on the mines and came back with nice things. Yeah. And so, you know, we often think it's in the moment that there's Shift the generational tension of the new generation. Yeah. The new nice things. Well, I would say. Yeah. Uh huh. Perhaps. But I mean, are there any in the various countries? Can you tell us? I mean, what are the current ones? Current what? 
I'm not sure what is the one I encountered way back then. Yeah. I wouldn't venture to know. Uh, because uh, all my my decade in uh, in Zimbabwe was in uh, in Harare and around Harare. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, although I married in Bolo <laughs> um, but they speak Shona. Uh, <laughs> so you said that the long history of these uh, the way the bond Yeah. Well, I was going to say that. Uh, another form of erasure actually here uh, is that the people who are considered elders now uh, were the same people who were considered youth. In fact, uh, this was explicit during the, during the liberation struggle because they were called the Bakumana, uh, the boys, okay? uh, the, the people fighting the war. Uh, and they've now become elders, so there's a sense in which this binary has nothing to do with an actual generational shift, it has to do with the logic of generation, uh, which, is, which is reiterative. It's iterated one generation after another. Though I expect, with some changes, um, maybe big changes, because frankly, uh, since 2000, uh, the, the structure of the economy in Zimbabwe has radically changed. Uh, and so, in Bourdieu's sense, you would think that that would lead to a different kind of habitus. Uh, a different kind of common sense. Um, but I would expect still that, that I will see like the young guys that I worked with deploying the same, uh, the same sort of discourse to their, uh, to their juniors as they, well, as we get older. Because <laughs> um, uh, they're all about my age now. Uh, you can hardly call them youth. Uh, only youth in the African sense. Yeah. I'm just wondering whether Charlie Fields, Nostalgia for the Future, tells us if there are kind of maps that we make in from the past. Or uh, I think you see that in, in certain kinds of Pentecostalism, uh, the sort of desire to completely uh, break with the past, uh, as uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, I forget her name. Oh, Rick Van Dyke. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Meyer and, and Rick Van Dyke from uh, doing his stuff in Malawi. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think one thing that people really underestimate uh, when looking at Zimbabwe is just how effective Zenofiat rhetoric is. And it's really effective. And I think that a lot of people really take this to be uh, a true statement about the world, uh, uh, a lot of Zimbabweans, uh, including urban ones, uh, who, like the, the young men that I work with, often sort of disparaged their own lives in precisely these terms. Like, like oh, we're living horrible lives, like, uh, we've, we've lost our way and we need to get it back. Um, Yeah, uh, thanks, Jeremy. Um, before I ask a question, I'd just like to say thank you for uh, appreciating your, your presentation with that short, Shona uh, presentation. It really brought to life a uh, group of spirit, uh, mm. knowing him as a kind of a person who was so in love with his own identity, language. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I'm grappling here to do with the question of the paradox that we spoke about earlier. Um, the paradox in everyday life, uh, not just in terms of economic terms, the like inflation and all that, but the paradox in terms of you have to guard in a position of power, um, but he will often get sick and then go, to, go overseas to get medical help. Um, so for me, that is the, the biggest paradox. That you have, you have power, but you are unable to use that power to just to save yourself. Um, yeah. And 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 also the other level of paradox is when there is a total rejection of whiteness as a standard, but there is nothing that has been given as an alternative to whiteness. Um, and how do people really deal with this kind of paradox in everyday life? Because at the macro level, then you have the institutions and politicians and all of that. At the 
micro level when where people are dealing with everyday life, they, this paradox is right there before their eyes. Mm -hmm. And how do they deal with this paradox? I mean, can they really can we really live without this paradox? Um, is it possible to imagine life without this paradox? I'm sorry, I, I have to ask this question because I'm really glad to be yeah. I would say first of all with the uh, with him traveling I mean, lots of people would comment on this Zimbabwean uh, not everybody uh, <laughs> not everybody appreciates that he's that he's done this I would say however that part of part of Zanopf rhetoric uh, over the past couple of decades and even before that to be honest going all the way back to its its formation uh, was a kind of not just pan Africanism, but a kind of uh, uh, what's the right word? Uh, third worldism. Third yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the ad here. Uh, I almost put it in, but I, I didn't. Uh, there was an ad from the same period where you saw. Uh, uh, white people standing on the backs uh, of various colonized people from around the world, uh, including Chinese, including uh, Maori from uh, from uh, New Zealand, uh, including uh, what was termed in the ad Red Indians, which is means Native Americans, uh, uh, so forth and so on. Uh, and so there's really a, a rhetorical effort to connect all of these colonial struggles. Uh, and so when, when uh, uh, now early on, Mugabe has this very close relationship with Malaysia, uh, which is not the same as Singapore, where he died, but uh, I think there is uh, there's somehow they see this as at least a little okay. Like if he had gone to the UK to die, uh, it would have been uh, <laughs> ironic. Um, as for the paradox, uh, there is a paradox here. Uh, there's a there's a is, is a sort of un unbridgeable paradox in the sense that uh, authentic blackness in this sort of setup always exists in the past. Uh, so in order to get it, you kind of have to go back to the past, and that makes for a really uh, strange notion of the present. Uh, as well as a strange notion of the future, it's like you have to, it's like you have to turn around to stand up, and I think that's a, a pretty good way of, of putting the way that they sort of express this. Like you had to turn around and go back, in order to go forward, uh, and that that makes that puts youth in a very awkward place, uh, I think, because being signs of the present. Uh, it means that they kind of have to go back into the past in order to, to go forward. And this only happens at the rhetorical level. Uh, I would say, in general, people are, are constantly driving towards the future in Zimbabwe. Uh, Zimbabweans are very future-oriented. <laughs> They're very hard-working. Uh, you know, even in the, with the collapse of, of institutions of schooling, people are very concerned with, with getting an education still. Uh, uh, and it's still very important to people. Uh, it's like uh, I'm trying to remember. There's an old an old song about it. It's like uh, a Leonard Dembo song, I think. Gadzuru, no, it's a four brothers. Gadzuru pinwa kwe mangwana. Like uh, like trying to to put together your life for the future, to prepare for your for your life, and you have to do all sorts of things. So people are actually very future-oriented, the, the rhetoric is not future-oriented in that same way. It is uh, very explicitly about the reclamation of something from the past, which is, uh, it's paradoxical because it involves sort of putting the genie back in the bottle. Uh, you, you can't go back to pre-colonial times. It's impossible. Uh, you can't go back to pre-colonial identities. That's impossible. Uh, it's impossible for all of us. Uh, this is a very similar kind of discourse in, in the U.S. about traditional values and so forth, which were never so great, actually, uh, but people were constantly sort of uh, 
pinning the future on the sort of reclamation of something, some idea of the past. I don't know if, I, there's no bottom to paradox, I guess. So I'm not sure if I've, I'm not sure if I've resolved it. <laughs> um, thanks for a really interesting presentation. I mean, it seems paradoxical to, to me in, in the sense that you're talking about a very powerful anti-colonial discourse that dictates very reactionary forms um, and um, reinforces misogyny and, and, um, and homophobia as well. Yeah, that's the other part of uh, the gender impropriety um, there, yeah. I mean, what, one of the questions I wanted to put to you, I, I taught um, in the Shingo Teachers College in, in the 1990s, and, and um, the, the term um, salad was used a lot in a very disparaging way, and particularly towards women, particularly women who came from urban areas were liable to be constructed as, as salads, and, and, and that sort of meant as they understood it, the kind of um, way of getting at them for not being authentically Zimbabwean. And the term vegetables was used as opposed to salads. Which was? Vegetables yeah. as opposed to salads. The vegetables were constructed, associated with, with women who were seen as more traditional and, and uh, as opposed to salads. Okay, In my age. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard that. Uh, but... Uh, uh, certainly, the the same sort of thing appears at uh, at uh, like UZ. Uh, in fact, the, the categories of, of population at UZ you have uh, on one hand there's an ethnic divide, like people who come from Bulawayo versus people who come from uh, or from Matabele land versus people who come from Ashuna land. Uh, these are important divides on campus. But then there's also the divide between the salads, so-called, uh, who are Anybody really who appears to come from the elite, uh, no matter their competence in Shona or anything like that, um, and uh, uh, hard my Shona types, the SRBs, uh, uh, strong rural background. Uh, <laughs> that means um, Mayuba uh, uh, University Bachelors Association. Um, uh, I think. Uh, and I didn't quite get to this in the talk, but I, I think the invocation of, of Chirungu, the invocation of Chisalala, uh, um, the in invocation of Nuz, uh, this is really very often done in a disciplinary fashion. It's trying to force people yeah. back into some kind of propriety, uh, which they are not respecting. And in that regard, it has a lot to do with gender. Uh, not just... Uh, not just forcing women to maintain a certain kind of gendered propriety, but forcing men to inhabit a certain kind of masculinity. Um, the, the hard Mashona type, uh, the, sort of, the sort of hardness, um, imperviousness to, uh, uh, to outside forces, um, uh, as opposed to the sort of softness that you heard in the, in the song. Uh, so it really is a disciplinary term. Uh, and in that regard, yeah, it's, it does have a reactionary feel to it. I, I think the interesting thing about what happened in Zimbabwe over the past uh, couple of decades is I think, to me personally, there's a kind of revolution that happened. I, you can't look at the, at the structure of the economy and not say that something really radical has changed in the country. Uh, the entire structure of the ownership of, of the land has changed. Uh, that's really important. But at the same time, it's going along with a, a real cultural conservatism. Uh, those two things have been, I would say, <laughs> paradoxically combined, uh, because it would seem that they wouldn't go together. Uh, but in reality, they have uh, a really distinct form of, of cultural conservatism, uh, including all of Mugabe's sort of uh, rants about homosexuals, um, which, which were frankly, an annual occasion. I don't know if it gets reported as much here in, uh, in South Africa, but he said that almost every time he had a birthday, I think he has <laughs> something to say about homosexuals. <laughs> um, this is like his, his birthday special. Um, <laughs> uh, that's the 
reacting to what Life was saying, it seems to me that we, we are trying to, to distinguish between modernity or to separate modernity and whiteness. We are talking about Chirungu. You said Chirungu is modernity. Yeah. yeah but my point is that, I don't know that makes sense, but that when you are talking about modernity, I think in Zimbabwe, just like Zambia, um, it goes hand in hand with whiteness. Yeah, because it's, and when you're talking about modernity, I think that in terms of culture, the material culture and the, you know, things to do with values. What I see in our cultures in Zambia, perhaps in Zimbabwe, is that uh, we do not talk bad or against the material culture, things like phones and vehicles and, and so on. But when this Western culture, when you say Chirungu, in Zambia we say Bachizungu, like modernity that is associated with values, that is the one that really we, we do not want, or that perhaps most of our people do not want. If, if that modernity is attacking our cultural values, then it's actually opposed. But if the modernity is to do with material things like phones and machines and many other things, we seem to embrace it. But if it attacks our, you know, for example, homosexuality and many other things, people may say it's modernity, but we don't see it as modernity. So we stick to our uh, cultural values. I think that's what is happening in, in, in our countries. But things like the phones, you know, material culture, we, we like it because <laughs> yeah. we can see the utility of all those things. But things that are attacking our values in terms of religion, I think we have, there hasn't been a, a, a change really. Do you, uh, Jeremy, before you respond, maybe you can just collect a few questions for me. We run it to the kind of towards the end or to the end of the seminar. But I know that you might still have questions, so maybe we can collect a couple of questions and we can just do a final response. If you, if that's okay. So if any other if anybody else has final questions, now would be the time to ask. I think um, with what you were saying it's similar even in West Africa, it's almost like we get to pick and choose when it's suitable for us. And um, also with the with where the whiteness is seen as a pure like you know, native word for a white person, why not chat a white, like a pure person. Um, but like he was saying, that when it comes to us retaining our values and, and sort of how it means to us as like um, individuals, we tend to shy away from that. And interest that is in Zimbabwe, I don't know how the community feels about um, when a white person sort of is invited to a ceremony and when they take part in that and how that sort of takes into um, the broader narrative of, of whiteness or whiteness. Is there anyone else? Last question? Oh, yes. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I'm going to pick up on other things I've said already, but just maybe to come a little differently. Um, so, in, in this is a law, is this like the, uh, uh, a black person, right, for lack of a better word, is more, right, or more, more that, you know, and, and that loosely translates to like a person. Right? But but it on the other side, like a white person is law, right? Which is it's not person. It's like it's just a, a thing. It's like it just is, right? So I'm wondering if there's kind of this um, if and and if if there's kind of a sh um, particularly yes, of course, for perhaps um, like a, a an urban person or you know community. That there's, there's a sense of a, a shift from person to thing, right? There's a move from being mundu to being umlu. Um, if there's, if you have anything to say, uh, say about that, and if, if there's, uh, then there are strategies in which this personhood, or this 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 munduness, um, that are strategies that are put in place to try and retain that, but also at the same time continue the process of becoming a, a thing. Yeah, uh, I'm going to take them in reverse order, if that's okay. <laughs> uh, 
I didn't uh, include it in my discussion of this story uh, about Zex going to the rural area. Uh, but the last thing that his grandfather s says to him is uh, to take care of his wunu. Uh, and wunu is the Shono equivalent, I guess, of Ubuntu. Uh, uh, however, uh, and I think, uh, I don't know, some of you may know Shannon, Shannon's not here, huh? Shannon Marrera at uh, UCT. Uh, she's written an interesting book about this. Uh, in, about the Zimbabwean constitution. Uh, the invocation of, of Wunu in the Shona sense uh, is uh, almost, it's not exactly like the way that it works, I think, in, the, in Wunu languages. Because when you say Wunu, you can also mean something almost equivalent to Tsika. Uh, that is, these sort of ways of uh, like indigenous ways. And that includes, if, if you have wunu in, in, uh, in, uh, in Shona, I think it's not just like a sort of personhood, it's a sort of, you inhabit certain kinds of roles properly. Like you, you respect hierarchy, for instance, like you respect your elders. And, and that's what you mean if you say somebody has wunu. Uh, it's not just uh, the sense of, of being uh, of being human. Um, uh, whether whether Shona speakers think uh, Rungu are are, uh, are human, I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, I will say that people have always treated me very nicely in Zimbabwe, so uh, I have I have nothing like, bad to say about uh, about that. Um, I think. Uh, I think it goes along with this question of inhabiting a certain kind of culture. Uh, wunu uh, is not just about, well, I mean, it goes along with the, the saying about Ubuntu. It's about certain kinds of relating. It's not simply about, uh, it's not simply about having something. It's about, it's about being something with other people. Uh, and to the extent that Warungu white people do not engage in those sorts of relations, I would say, yeah, they probably lack Ubuntu, or they lack Wunu, uh, because they sort of fail to respect uh, what people take to be uh, the proper way of being a human. Um, and, yeah, I mean, if you look at the sort of violence of, of uh, Rhodesian colonialism, there's really no way to deny that. That's exactly what they did. They, they disrespected that, uh, that kind of human relation. Um, very, yeah, literally violently uh, in, in a lot of cases. Um, uh, I think Zimbabweans, Shona and and otherwise are very uh, canny about differentiating between different kinds of white people though. Uh, whatever the sort of grammatical category is, uh, they can tell the difference between different kinds. Um, with respect to West Africa, um, uh, what occurred to me when you were talking, I, I think that there's no way to like generalize like how Africans do this, although people often do exactly that, uh, which is to say they, they sort of think about how Africans think about white people. But I think it really depends a whole lot, not just on, on a sort of national or ethnic context, but uh, on, on class context as well. Uh, because I think that if you go to a rural area in Zimbabwe where people are just uh, um, uh, doing their, their rural thing, they will have different ideas about Warungu than somebody who's gone to like a, uh, uh, a former whites only school. Uh, or somebody, for instance, who spent a long time in South Africa where their engagement with actual white people is, is uh, much more pronounced. Uh, I mean, you can go, somebody in a rural area in Zimbabwe can go years without seeing a white person, except, you know, maybe on TV. Uh, much less interacting with them. Uh, that's not the case here uh, in, in South Africa. Uh, so 
I would say that, that we have to differentiate, I guess, between those sort of rhetorical systems that people sort of hang their experience on the pegs provided by that rhetorical system, a discursive system, versus their actual experience, which may or may not conform to it um, in different ways. Um, in terms of the material, the question of modernity, there are a lot of ways to say modernity in, in, uh, in Shona, uh, including just using the English. Um, you know, people do that. They say mazuanu, uh, meaning these days, um, which can mean literally these days, like mazuanu, like these days, uh, uh, I live in Massachusetts, you could say that, but sometimes if you say mazuanu, you really mean um, uh, 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 you really mean modernity, uh, like here, uh, in the next to last line here. Uh, so the, there are other ways to express this, and I think uh, I think you're right insofar as you and you see this uh, further along in this uh, not this one, but the the textbook that the lots of textbooks, in fact. Uh, uh, in the Shona curriculum, uh, talk about like things of modernity, like material life. And they talk about it in very um, neutral terms. Okay, so you'll see like whole sections about going to the post office and you know sending a telegram, which no living Zimbabwe has ever done, um, or you know uh, purchase hire, all kinds of things that appear in the in a Shona textbook, but then when they talk about uh, Chirungu or things of Mazuanu, uh, they are talking, in fact, what you say about values. Um, I would say this, uh, a couple of things. First of all, that differentiation between values and material life is actually internal to modernity. It's internal to, to the to the ideology of modernity. And in that sense, it is a representation of modernity, the very divide. And you find it all over the world, uh, including in places that, uh, from an African point of view, I think would be unquestionably modern, like the United States. Okay, uh, so uh, the, other, the other thing is, is that it's, it is this sort of paradox, because this is really an impossible divide. Uh, the notion that you can accept just the things and not any of the stuff that goes along with them is, uh, you know, uh, that's capitalism. Capitalism destroys values. <laughs> it's what capitalism does. It's very good at it. Uh, uh, so, insofar as you participate in it, you are, any of us, I think, you know, we're participating in the, the constant destruction of values. Uh, so. Uh, it's a, it's an important rhetorical divide, but I'm not sure it's a, it's actually a plausible agenda. Uh, like I, I don't, I don't know if it actually works. Like you can take the cell phone, but not all the stuff that comes with cell phones. Like people cheating, and uh, sending each other pornography, and all the other things that people do with, uh, with cell phones. Uh. Thank you.